I'm M. Sauter, better known as Pints and Panels. And I'm Don Tess, better known as the Don of Beer. Welcome to the second episode of the All About Beer podcast. Every two weeks, we talk with leading experts and take a deep dive into one topic in beer. Be sure to visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on all social media platforms at All About Beer. And if you want to throw us a couple bucks, visit patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. This week on the show, we're going to talk about new hops. Of course, there are a lot of sexy new hops being released every year, but how does that happen? How do new hops get created? M, what's your favorite new hop? I think my favorite new hop, I'm a huge fan of this, is the Hellertau Blanc out of Germany. Uh, big pineapple, love it in IPAs. What about you, Don? Um, I know I may be in the minority in this, but I love Sabro. Uh, I yeah, just I just okay. think it's so interesting that, that <laughs> out of a hop, you get, uh, you know, you get coconut flavors. I think that's super that, cool. That is really cool. That is really cool. I'll well, allow it. <laughs> so hopefully we'll find out how uh, Holotar Blanc or Sabro came about from our two guests and we'll learn all about the science and work that goes into creating new hops. But uh, we'll introduce our guests uh, and get into a conversation. First, we want to take a moment to hear from our sponsors. And if you'd like to help support the show, uh, please reach out to podcast at allaboutbeer.com. This show is brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Athletic Brewing Company's award-winning craft non-alcoholic beers are fit for all times. Downtime, work time, game time, even gym time. Pick a time and grab an athletic because it's about time you could enjoy a great tasting brew anytime you want, even right now. Head to athleticbrewing.com and get some fresh brews delivered. New customers can even get 20% off with code ALLABOUTBEER20 and free shipping on two six packs or more. Hi, this is John Hall, the editor of All About Beer, inviting you to check out the Drink Beer, Think Beer podcast. It's available on all of the major platforms and the weekly show features long form conversations with brewers, growers, and personalities from the beer industry. New episodes release every Wednesday. Just search Drink Beer, Think Beer. If you've ever read a book or magazine article about hops, you've probably heard of Stan Hieronymus. In addition to books like Brewing with Wheat, Brew Like a Monk, and Brewing Local, Stan is an internationally recognized expert on all things hops. He's the author of For the Love of Hops, which remains the most important book for those interested in Humulus Lupulus. He updates the information in that book with his free monthly newsletter, Hop Queries. Our second guest is Sean Townsend. Sean is an associate professor, senior research in the Crop and Soil Sciences Department at Oregon State University. He has been working in hop breeding and genetics since December 1998 at OSU, first as a postdoctoral research associate in collaboration with the USDA's hop breeding program and genetics program located at Corvallis, and later as technical lead for OSU's Aroma Hops breeding program. The OSU program is a joint effort with Indie Hops, a Portland, Oregon-based hop supplier. Sean's niche within the industry is to develop new Aroma Hop cultivars, targeting the craft beer industry and adapted for Western Oregon growing conditions, as well as genetic research in hops. Welcome to the show, Stan and Sean. Thanks. Um, so for the benefit of our listeners who maybe don't understand, I guess, even the basics of how hop breeding works, you know, public versus private, maybe I'll start with you, Sean. Can you kind of explain uh, that whole industry background i guess and explain it like you're like talking to me i'm in kindergarten because i my knowledge of hop breeding is poor at best so keep it keep it elementary thank you <laughs> sure yeah no problem uh well the breeding part of it is the same regardless of whether it's in the public sector or the private sector in terms of the processes that we use the difference comes down to funding historically the public breeding programs were funded from public monies, and then the varieties developed or cultivars developed would be released uh, as public cultivars. On the private side, the, the difference then is the money is supplied by a private entity, and then often those cultivars that result from that effort are protected somehow, in hop typically a plant patent. So, it, and that's basically the difference between the two. The process is about the same either way. Can you give me an example of 
a private hop that only one hop company has, just as an example? Well, sure. Strata would be one. Citra would be another. Who owns the so who owns Strata is a is one of yours, correct? Yeah. So in my case, my program is a bit of a hybrid program. It's a joint effort between Oregon State University and Indy Hops. But the intellectual property that comes from this, in this case, Strata, is sold to Indy Hops. So they own the IP behind it okay. when we are done with the process. So it's a little bit different. It's a bit of a hybrid process that way. But I'm an OSU employee. So okay. I'm not an Indy Hops employee. Uh, Citra would be another example. That's a truly private entity. So Got then Thank conversely, you. what are some public hops? So some of the public hops would be something like Cascade. That would probably be the one that everyone would recognize. Perhaps Nugget as well. There's a, there's, yeah, there's a new one called Vista. Uh, someone, the person who's talking, did the logo for it. So, you know, just uh, just saying that. So Yes, Vista would be <laughs> one of the newer ones. Yes. <laughs> So then um, what drives either on the public or private side, um, what are hop breeders looking for when they're breeding? What are they looking to accomplish, I guess, when they're uh, breeding a new hop? Right. That's a good question, Don. And the way that uh, we approach that is we define uh, what our target market is, for starters, and then also the target environment or environments that we would want those new varieties to grow in. So I'll just use my, my program as an example. My niche within the industry is to develop new aroma type hop cultivars that would be desired by the craft industry. And they would be targeted for growing in Western Oregon. So basically the Willamette Valley. So from an agronomic perspective, then I'm looking at the traits that would be important for growth here within the Willamette Valley. And then from the sensory side, then those traits that the craft industry would be interested in. So that's really what drives uh, the breeding process. And um, we haven't heard from Stan yet. So Stan, do you have any, anything to add to that? Well, I think when you're talking about the breeding process, and I'm just going to throw this back to Sean, is he might want to walk you through each year during development of, say, the strata hop, you know, what happened in year, how he got to year one, which was to make a cross, and then year by year before it was eventually released. Sure. And how ma wait, how many years does it take total? It's a lot, right? Oh, yeah, it's typically uh, at least 10 years. The, the average for uh, all the USDA hops that they've released is 13 years. Right. And yeah. in 13, with 13 years, the industry has changed exactly. so much. So how do you, like, you know, if you were going to tell me in 2011 when I was living in the Willamette Valley that people were going to be prizing certain hops in 2022 for, I don't know, you know, the tropical notes and whatnot. Um, I would have been like, you're crazy. It's all about the IBU, man. So it's just so how do you tell the future? Yeah, right. I wish I could predict it, you know, because <laughs> I'd probably be a very wealthy man. But uh, what we do is, uh, well, let's just use climate change as an example. So I have already started working on uh, genotypes within the program that might be more resilient to what's proposed or what's being forecasted for our, our area in the next 10 years in terms of uh, reduced water availability, perhaps in, um, increased stresses due to heat and that sort of thing, uh, warmer winters. So as a plant breeder, you, you, you know, you do have to look to the future somewhat, but then, you know, it's, it's hard to predict that, obviously. But the other thing that we can do is, you know, what I do in my program anyway, is that I have a broad genetic range of material in my program at any one time. And so as these challenges or new market opportunities might arise in the future, the chances are pretty good that I have a, a genetic line within my program that might fit within that new niche, if you will. 
So there's some things we can do like that to help, but you can't really predict, obviously, what 10 years is going to look like. So, so do you think, and, and maybe I'll turn this to Stan then, um, do you think uh, what beer consumers want drives the innovation in hops, or do you think the innovation in hops is actually pushing consumer trends? Because I, I uh, you know, to M's point, if you were developing, you know, these super tropical hops 13 years ago when they weren't popular, then was this just sheer luck that that you, you hit the hit the nail on the head, or or is there some actual brewer acceptance of all things new, and then that can, that pushes consumer trends? Well, one thing that's helped the private programs is quite often um, they're the ones that are going to end up selling the hops. So that allows them to put experimental varieties in the hands of many brewers. A, to get feedback and see what the brewers want. B, to create excitement for that new variety so they know they can plant a fair amount of it right coming out of the gate. But it's, in terms of thinking about the future, I think the Citra hop is, is a really nice example about how things change because Citra has, it, it was the hop at the center of when people started talking about tropical and fruitier when it was released in 2008. Uh, but that hop was developed for one brewery uh, that financed this. And at the time that was the uh, Haas breeding program. And Gene Probosco head of that. That was the first private breeding program in the United States. Um, and that starts a little bit earlier than when they did the cross for Citra. Um, and so that brewery, you know, paid to have they they selected 50 varieties, 50 Stan, different Stan, hops. are you allowed to tell us what brewery or is it like a secret? Uh that that brewery, it's uh not generally publicized. But got it. it was yeah. in the north of England. Um, <laughs> and, but they, they tested all 50 of these potential hop varieties um, and they decided they didn't want any of them. Oh. But there was one variety Gene Probosco thought was pretty nice. So we set that to the side and he kept that going. And then a second brewery, and I have no idea who that brewery was, was interested in, and once again, he says, would you, will do a bunch of tests with this hop and they grew it out to not, not acres, but more hills of the hop. And eventually that second brewery decided, nope, weren't interested. So, uh, and this, this is a cross that, that he originally made in the eighties and, and the cross that resulted, I mean, during this process of the breeding uh, by 1990, it was the variety that would become Citra, but now it's the, early aughts and he's going to a convention uh, with Pat Ting, who is a hop scientist at Miller. And Pat says, we're looking for a hop with a certain kind of a fruity citrus character. And Gene says, I've got just the hop for you. Um, and again, Miller paid to have a few more hills that spread tested over time. They did bunches of test beers with it, including a, a, a double IPA. It was called uh, Pat Ting's Wild Thing. Um, That's an amazing and, name. I'm sorry. That's just great. <laughs> and, and eventually Miller just didn't know what they would do with the hop. And they were probably right. Uh, at this point, uh, the, you had the hop breeding program, which brought together um, the, the breeding program from uh, Yakima, ranches with the Haas program. <clears throat> and they began to put this hop in the hands of other craft breweries. Uh, and they financed it out to multiple acres. Um, and that was uh, Widmer, Sierra Nevada, and Deschutes. Uh, and in 2008, Widmer growing with this, uh, uh, brewing with this experimental hop, won uh, a gold medal mm -hmm. at the World Beer Cup. Um, and at that point, it was going public. It only took 18 years. <laughs> um, pretty, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of a cynical person. Uh, so I'm going to ask kind of a, 
a weird question, I guess. So Citra becomes popular, and then do do hop breeders go? Oh well, Citra is popular. I should make something even more tropical. Like, is it? Well, but I, not necessarily more tropical. But they began to select. So, so each and and Sean could talk about his experiences. But each year at harvest, um, brewers are going to the Northwest and walking in these fields where experimental hops are growing, and they're taking those from the vines and and rubbing them and seeing what they smell like and maybe getting excited about it. So now you have like at the Haas program, which is a partnership, HBC, in an experimental brewery there, the hops that are farther in the process um, are being brewed with. And so brewers can actually taste beers made with these hops. Um, and I'm not sure the new one is in place at Yakima Chief Ranches yet, but they're putting in a pilot brewery there as well so that people can sample all of their experimentals. So the mm-hmm. brewers get to know it that way. And that's that's at a marketing aspect. So back uh, when, when Don, when you ask about, you know, what drives these new flavors, I think brewers are central to it. It's the hops that excite them, but they're also mm-hmm. thinking about what are the hops that my customers are going to want. Okay. I guess, you know, I, you know, every year there's, it seems like there's a, there's a bunch of new hops that get named first of all, and then there's a bunch of new hops that are uh, just still have their experimental name, HBC 472 or, or whatever. And like, is it necessarily the case that new hops are better or is this just, you know, quote unquote innovation for the sake of creating something new and shiny every year? Well, but I, I think Sean talked about, you know, what he's doing looking forward, for instance, uh, the Hopsteiner program, you know, they set per certain parameters that they're not going to release a hop unless it uh, is, I believe it's 10% better yield than average in the Yakima Valley. Um, they just released a hop Helios, which is, um, it isn't an aroma hop. So, so brewers are going to use it for very efficient alpha and it has a super high yield that it's may push 20 barrels per acre. Um, and it also is, uh, disease resistant. So looking to the future, um, and Sean's can talk a little bit about uh, figuring out that the hop genome because I don't understand it at all. So he should definitely be the one talking about it. Um, but as 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 breeders begin to look for that, they they see markers for diseased resistance. Um, they're trying to get hops that are obviously drought resistant. Um, hop Steiner's just started a program where they, they spent, I believe, it's three years. Uh, checking the uh, CO2 emissions involved in growing all of their private varieties and many of the public varieties. So you can see, for instance, that, that Helios, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the CO2 emissions of that per pound are like 1.39. And a, a recent public hop, Kashmir, the CO2 emissions of that are 5.26 CO2 mm. per pound. So if brewers start paying attention to that, which they should, um, this will be something else that breeders are trying to do. They do this at the same time, of course, looking for the good, either alpha characteristics or the aroma characteristics of the hot varieties. So, um, yeah, I, have, so I have a question. So I, I want to go back, if that's okay, Don, because Don's in yes. charge today. No, I want to go back. I wanted to go back too. So you go I first. Wanna, um, and I want to know, so Sean, how does, how does this start? How does like your day begin in the morning? Are you, you know, like it's year, well, it's year one, day one. What are you doing? And then kind of make it, you know, on the snappier side, but like, mm-hmm. yeah, compress 13 years into like a few minutes for me, if, if sure. possible. Um, well, how does it happen? Tell me how the magic happens. Well, it starts with a lot of coffee. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, yeah, days are early. Uh, so we collect seed. We do crosses in July every year, collect seed. And then those represent, those seed represent a number of different families, depending on how many parents we used in the crosses. 
the seed is screened in a greenhouse in January every year, and I make my initial selections at that point. And we won't even talk about traits at this point. We'll just, this is kind of a 30,000 foot view. Those selected seedlings are up potted. We move them into the field setting. And the first year they are evaluated on a smaller trellis for additional traits. And we will make some selections during the summer. And then that following winter when they are dormant in January, typically, then we'll plant them under the standard trellis, the 18 to 20 foot trellis in the field. And then at that point, they enter into a five to 10 year, well, I should say eight to 10 year process of evaluating for agronomic characteristics that are important to the environment. And in my case, it's Western Oregon. And then we are, we are also doing the sensory work with Indy hops at that point. And that involves a lot of rub and sniff and also working with various craft brewers that they work with and it gets into the test brewing at some point and so on and so forth. And so it, over time, you know, we're looking at more than 50 traits mm. total for these plants, probably closer to 60 or 70 over. How, sorry yeah. to interrupt. How many plants do you do a year? So like, what's the, you know, how do you whittle it? You start with a lot, correct? And then you whittle it down each year to... Right. Yeah, we start with, uh, so plant breeding in general is a numbers game. So the more plants you can look at, the better chances are you'll find something really unique. But it's also balanced by available resources, time, money, land area, and so on. So we typically start with, I don't know, four to 5,000 plants, seedlings mm -hmm. a year wow. in the greenhouse. And then after 10 years, uh, that's probably down to three or four plants from that particular cross year that Ooh. might have some merit. So uh, we throw most all of it away right. eventually. I, I was talking to a barley breeder a while back and he was saying, you know, between all the different breeds that they'll plant and, and planting them in, in different farms and different climates to get one new barley variety, he will plant between 30,000 and 50,000 plots, plots of barley. And from what you just told me, you know, four to, four to 5,000 a year times you know, 10 to 13, like it's kind of the same ballpark. Is that right? Yeah, it's just, it's just a lot. It's, and again, plant breeding is a numbers game. So the more plots or the more plants that we can look at, the better our odds are of finding something that's a diamond in the rough, if you will. So it's a numbers game. And that's why hops are so expensive. <laughs> well, uh, the development of it, yeah, it's it's a long, expensive process, both in terms of money and labor, effort, whatnot. It's a, it, it, it takes a village, really does. It's not just me. There's a number of people that are very important to the, the process. Okay, well, speaking of important, let's take a short break here and uh, listen to uh, some notes from our sponsors. This show is brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Athletic Brewing Company's award-winning craft non-alcoholic beers are fit for all times. Downtime, work time, game time, even gym time. Pick a time and grab an athletic because it's about time you could enjoy a great tasting brew anytime you want, even right now. Head to athleticbrewing.com and get some fresh brews delivered. New customers can even get 20% off with code allaboutbeer20 and free shipping on two six packs or more. Hi, this is John Hall, the editor of All About Beer, inviting you to check out the Drink Beer, Think Beer podcast. It's available on all of the major platforms, and the weekly show features long-form conversations with brewers, growers, and personalities from the beer industry. New episodes release every Wednesday. Just search Drink Beer, Think Beer. Um, so just before the break there, Sean, you were kind of explaining a bit of the process. Uh, it sounds you know, laborious and painstaking. Are there any uh, developments lately to make it more efficient, like, like uh, gene editing or using more greenhouses so you can maybe do multiple, um, multiple crops in one season or what's the frontier? Yeah, uh, I probably the most exciting things, Don, would, uh, would revolve around some of the new genetic technology that's coming out where we can look at DNA sequences quickly and easily and associate some of these sequences with traits of interest like DNA mildew resistance or powdery mildew resistance and whatnot. 
And the beauty of that is once we have associated these DNA sequences with traits of interest, we can select right in the greenhouse at the seedling stage for a number of different traits right off the bat before they ever get outside. We can have a pretty good handle on what this particular seedling might be like as a mature plant, both in terms of its agronomic performance and its brewing performance. So I think that that's really the future with hot breeding, especially given the expense of it, uh, being a long-lived perennial plant that has these unique infrastructure requirements for production. Uh, we do the same thing in the breeding program as a commercial grower would do, use the same equipment and whatnot. So uh, I think the genetic technology uh, and the ability to associate these traits of interest with unique sequences is really the future. So that would be GMO though, right? And that's well, the, no, not that's, necessarily. Um, not necessarily because uh, well, that's that's the that's the the dirty word that people don't like when, on a on a surface level. But continue. Sure. Um, yeah. So if we we're not inserting foreign sequences into the genome of something to add these traits to it, we're just simply using uh, the information. Got it. And looking for those sequences to see if they are, are present or not. And then we use that in selection. Does that make sense? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're not, I'm, I'm not doing it. Uh, I'm not inserting foreign genes into this. Uh, it's, we just simply use the information to see if those genes are present or not. And are you just decide to select or not. Are you aware of anybody who is inserting uh, genes into Ooh. new? Yeah, not in the hop world. I don't oh. know that the market would accept it. So uh, I know that the ability exists to do that, but no, I'm not aware of anybody doing that. Okay. Everybody can drink their beer knowing that their hops are all <laughs> non-GMO. GMO free, yeah, right. non-GMO. Awesome. Uh, I, I would add, and actually Don knows about this uh, because of the yeast involved, but people are using uh, genetically modified, I guess that becomes GMO. So we'll say genetically engineered because in the case, at least one strain cosmic punch from Omega, that that is using the CRISPR. So it's, it, it, they're going to be able, it, it, New Zealand and Australia, for instance, will accept having that yeast shipped in. Um, mm. It's generally only in the United States. Not all of them are that way. But anyway, the, these yeast strains are being used uh, in order to free the uh, thiol precursors, which are very popular right now in getting tropical flavor and beer and things like that. And it, it's hard to get those unbound out of, out of hops. So GMO and hops are kind of dating. Well, but, uh, I mean, you, I, I remember listening to, I think it was the NBAA podcast about the CRISPR and yeast. And they say that when they use it, the flavor is less nuanced. It's kind of a one note versus when you use hops and then you use hops in a different part of the brewing process, everything is different. So, but I mean, I like the idea of yeast kind of helping out when, especially with hops being the, the price hops, you know, being an agricultural product. I mean, you could have a bad, especially with the way that climate change is going, wildfires, um, other, you know, other factors. I mean, hops are expensive and Oh, it's 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 interesting. I love the future of beer because it is so unique and interesting, um, especially from the hops front. I know that I wanted to talk about climate change, and I know Don did too a little more about what we're doing in the future, especially like I see hops growing in places I don't think of, like Connecticut, where our soil is utter garbage. So, but it's cool to see hops growing here and being really unique and tasting different because of the terroir, because of where they're grown. So I wanted to see if either of you would speak to growing hops other places. I know, you know, I don't know, something to think about. Do you want to go first, Sean? Uh, no, go ahead, Stan. Um, but no. I, I think the question becomes, it's, it's, it's great to have a local product. Um, I wrote a book called Brewing Local, so obviously I feel that way. Um, and, and they can have unique character. Uh, 
and you do not have to ship them a long way. So, so that's a positive for the climate. But, but the thing is, if you, if you can grow a flavorful, say we want a Roman flavor hop very efficiently in the Northwest where it uses, um, well, it's basically it's CO2 emissions or less because it does not need to be sprayed as often, which is a real problem in almost every place else other than the Northwest. Um, so it, it's more disease resistant. It's more drought resistance, perhaps. Uh, Hopsteiner is certainly working on that in incorporating uh, Native American hops into their breeding program that, that have lived a long time in the Southwest in drier conditions. So when, when those hops are harvested and turned into a lighter product, it may be more environmentally friendly for a brewery in Connecticut to use hops grown in the Northwest than it is in the Northeast. So I think you have to put all of those things together. Mm -hmm. Although presumably as research moves forward, maybe that changes. It, it could, but the conditions over much of the rest of the country are not, there's always going to be real, uh, uh, problem with pests and diseases. Every, everything east of the Mississippi, you know, has some other hops growing around native, not growing in, in uh, hop yards or anything like that, that are passing disease along. So even though oh. you're keeping your own yard clean and you're bringing clean stock all the time, you're still going to get that um, disease issues. Uh, so that's, that's just one example of the challenges of growing hops east of the Mississippi. Yeah, it's a complex thing. Stan brings up some good points. And the other thing I would add to that is that uh, almost all of the breeding activity that I'm aware of is here in the Pacific Northwest for hops. And so we are targeting this particular part of the country for the production. So if you move these plants, these genotypes, say east of the Mississippi, for example, um, we may, well, we don't, but some of the other programs may test back there but it's really not a target environment per se from a breeding perspective. So Is the plants, what? yeah, they're selected to grow here in the Pacific Northwest. And other places like Huell or in New Zealand or uh, in Kent. the UK yeah, and Kent, are they same? Are they focused on where they are? And like, that's why the, you know, Huell would be the place to grow hops in Germany. I mean, they're they doing the same kind of looking at where they're from and saying, all right, what will grow best here? What's the future of this place? Yeah, exactly. And that's the, the plant breeding process. That's one of our principles is that you, you select and test within the target environment. So. An advantage in New Zealand is that they have much less issue with, uh, with pest and disease. They just have sheep. That's all they have, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and sheep who do not graze on hops. Yeah. Do you work with, like, say, in New Zealand, will they call you and be like, Sean, I need your help? Or like, hey, Stan, can you come down to New Zealand and check out how we do this? Like, is there, do you guys chat? Are you pals? Like, or uh, is it like a competition? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I want to think there's no competition in beer. Um, but I would think you would want to share data unless it's proprietary and secret, like what's that like? Right, so no, there's a lot of discussion among plant breeders. And yes, I do interact with the New Zealand group. Uh, Ron Beetson's now retired, but I just had a interaction about a month ago with a private breeder down there. And we had worked on some, uh, some techniques up here and she was very interested in what we had done. So she had reached out to me about that. And then I'm, I work with, um, one of the Slovenian hop breeders. So mm -hmm. we, we go back and forth sharing information and whatnot. So no, the, the community, uh, we, we have a nice hop development community around the world and we all get along pretty well and all interact. I love that. Yeah, That's it's nice. great. That's I really nice. enjoy that, yeah. That's really uh, nice. So um, from a beer lover's standpoint, um, so putting, I guess, agronomics aside, what are the what are the things, I guess, that you're working on, Sean? Uh, is it more, is it more tropical again, or now looking at uh, thiols, or what? What's the hot trend? Yeah, Don, I 
I don't know what the hot trend is. Um, typically, my approach is is to uh, you know, I, I look at hops as the brewer's palette of colors that they paint with, right? And so I don't want to bring another yellow to the palette. I want to bring something a little different to the palette that they don't currently have. Right. So I just try to bring something different. The, the crosses that I do and the selections that I make and then working with indie hops, obviously, on this. Uh, the goal, I think Jim Solberg's, fame, his quote that he likes to use is, we don't want to bring sand to the beach. So it <laughs> brings something you new and unique and whatnot that they don't currently have to brew with that's that's kind of our goal overarching goal so so how does that work then because if you're you don't want to bring sand to the beach but if you're located on the beach and all you have to breathe from <laughs> yeah, is right. other sand where do you find not sand from right so that's that's part of my job is to sort that out from a genetic standpoint from a plant breeding standpoint is and that's a lot of data analysis and whatnot that i do internally to try to come up with crosses, design crosses and whatnot that will produce offspring that are different and unique, still agronomically suitable for this area, but because I always have to have an eye on the agronomic performance, but uh, that might produce offspring that are unique from a brewing, a sensory standpoint. So, so if I can uh, use Sabro as an example where it really has very strong, you know, coconut flavors and that kind of came out of nowhere, at least. I had not experienced that in a hop before. Was that was that luck, or how does that? Well, do sometimes it's, yeah, sometimes it can be luck, but it's also it, it comes back to the parents that you use, Don. So uh, if so, I use a lot of somewhat exotic parents in my crossing scheme sometimes, and I do that uh, in an effort to bring in novel flavors and aromas that we might not usually have. Now, very often we get stuff in the field that's just terrible. You probably never want to brew with it, but over two or three generations of selection and whatnot and additional crosses, we can refine that to something that's a bit more pleasant. Still what different. Do you, what do you fun. mean exotic? Well, so by exotic, I'm, I'm talking about usually wild uh, okay. germplasm that we brought in or that I have obtained somehow. Uh, so I went on a plant collection expedition in Colorado in 2019, actually just before the pandemic started, and collected a lot of wild type hops from the back country in Colorado. And so we are looking through some of that material now to see if there's anything of interest in there. That, that would be an example of something exotic. <clears throat> Isn't Cascade from, isn't that like a... Isn't that a Russian? Russian. Uh, it has, it has some Serebrianca in it, right? Yeah, that was, yeah. yeah. But it's mostly Fuggle, and and it become and it's fifty eight percent unknown. Unknown. Uh, so, so that American Different. Wild. Uh, so I, I and this will be this is a total geek question that you may want to edit out. So of, of the hops that you're collecting, <laughs> Colorado, Sean, you know if they're are they Neo Mexicanus or Lupuloides? Uh They are ne Neo Mexicanus. Okay, interesting. Okay, yeah. And I want to keep. I, I want to keep that drivers. in. Yeah, Pardon? and I, I want to keep that in. Is what I'm I want to keep that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and what are the two care? Like I, I can't even repeat what uh, what you just said. But what are those two strains of of hops, and, and what's the difference? Well, they're closely related, but but they're both American as a, oh, I see. and have characteristics that you don't get with European. Uh, and and there there's a part like Citra, for instance, is is uh, seven eighths European, but that one eighth of American has made it a very different hop. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, Don, you could think of it as somewhat like a subspecies. Okay. So if, if that helps. Yeah. Yeah. There there was a time that they were just called Americanus. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any work uh, in terms of, you know, speaking of subspecies and, and, and exotic uh, parents, uh, you know, in, in other beverages, there's, you know, CBD or whatever is, is trendy. And of course, uh, hops are a cousin of, of uh, marijuana. Is there any breeding in that area? Uh, current, well, I can't speak for other programs. I don't know. Uh, we are not doing that at this point. There's still some 
I think, legal issues and whatnot, not to mention scientific issues to work out with that. Right, right. Mm. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, that's something that for a long time I would have would like to try, but currently we're not really at a position where we can do that. All right. Well, once we stop uh, recording, you can tell us the real answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, that is the real answer. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the real answer at this okay. point. Okay. So. <laughs> I have a question. So how do consumers, so I, I work part-time at a brewery and we'll make, oh, my cat's here. Um, <laughs> you want to be on the show? All right, come on. Um, if you want to try, you're a customer and you want to try the, you can go and have like a HBC something or like, what is, if I'm a consumer and I go in and I, the hop just has a number, what does that, what does that mean? You know, where so are we the, at in the process? Right. Um, well, I can't speak for a hop breeding company. That's but, true. That's not but, you. But like if, yeah. how does the USDA or Indie Hops, do they do, sure. un, un, do they sell some of their non-named hops or is that just HPC? Like how does it? Yeah. So in the case of the OSU, my OSU program, what we do mm -hmm. is, um, so I come up with the genotype names internally. So these numbers are, they're something meaningful to me internally. And then uh, when the selected material moves into Indie Hops court for the sensory testing and whatnot, they just retain those, those numbers that I have used. They may shorten it a little bit or whatnot, but um, that number that you see is just an experimental designation that we use internally for record keeping so that we know what the genotype is. So what you see then when you see an experimental beer made with one of these experimental hops that just does that just designates that it's an experimental, it's in testing. So, so can you give us an example of a real number that you're working on or real name? Uh, yeah, well, Strata was, um, it was 9-1-331 internally, and it was shortened to X331 when we moved it into Indie Hops sensory testing. And then when okay. they had the experimental breers, I think you probably saw X331. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So then I assume 331 is just consecutive numbers, but does, and you were saying that these numbers mean something to you. Does the nine mean something? Does the one mean something? Oh, yeah. All of that, it, it's all internally yes and it, in my case i just use it as the year of the cross the family within that year and then the end of the last number is the individual within that family so every so, plant breeding company or corp or group or program would do that differently that's just right. what i do so if i'm a consumer and i'm seeing x331 or rewind to before strata was released as strata if i saw x331 I, as a consumer, wouldn't be able to figure anything out about that hop from no, that number. No, that's, there's nothing, no, you wouldn't know anything about it. In, in the case of the Steiner hops, if you see an experimental like 17701, um, the, the first number there, 17, will mean that's, that's when it went into the field. Cross mm -hmm. was probably made in 16. Right. Uh, but that's, they're one of the few that you can look at their code. If you go clear back, Dewey S. Salmon, who really started hop breeding at White College more than 100 years ago, is with uh, Brewer's Gold, for instance, was CA9, and that just meant its position in the field. Um, and, and in that case, it was like in row C, column A, and it was the ninth uh, hop that had trialed in that particular spot. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, so basically, we all have our own Reason code or how we come up with a number and it's just helps us make make sense of it internally okay well uh maybe i'll ask either stan or sean uh you know here we are it's 2022 uh what should beer drinkers look forward to in 2023 or 2024 like what's, well, what's imminent i guess uh, uh sean's got a nice hop that actually got a name although i think there are only 30 acres of it Luminosa, it's really interesting, mm -hmm. but you're going to have to hunt that out because there's not a lot of that hop around right now. What, what is that hop? What is it like? Uh, it, the the neat thing. Well, you, Sean should talk about it. <laughs> what no, the no, heck? No, 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 you're doing great. Yeah, go, come go on. <laughs> um, uh, it 
So, no, one, why don't you explain the parentage, Sean? Just go through that process to begin with, and then, then, then I'll get around to the dill. <laughs> okay. So the, uh, that particular genotype came from uh, um, Sirachi Ace, <clears throat> and it uh, as the female parent, and I don't know the male parent. That's what we call open pollinated. So it's just whatever the wind brought, but pollen. And so we eventually we will figure out the male parent based upon some genetic work that we can do. But currently I don't know the male parent to that. And that was one of those, uh, we hadn't really used a lot of Sirachi Ace in the program. So that was just kind of one of those, I guess, somewhat exotic crosses that we talked about earlier, M. Mm -hmm. And, um, and again, it was uh, the reason I do something like that is because I'm just trying to have a broad genetic based population of plants in the program at any one time so that I can be somewhat responsive to new market opportunities or climate change or whatnot. And that cross was one of was made for that particular reason. So for there, I will turn it over to Stan and he can give you the deal. So Sriracha Ace is a somewhat divisive hop. Um, because it has characteristics people don't like, including this dill note, but it has this wonderful bright lemon note as well. So Luminosa manages to discard the stuff you don't like, or at least I don't like. Um, it, it's, it is worth noting that Sriracha Ace was just sitting in a USDA bank uh, in the aughts, and Darren Gamash from Gamash Farms went and picked that hop up and said, I, I think this is pretty interesting. He planted in the field. It got a certain amount of fame because Brooklyn uh, Brooklyn Brewery made Sriracha Ace with Sriracha Ace, the Saison, and it was a pretty striking Saison. So it, it got some, it, and for a while it was grown a fair amount, but, it, but it's not a super popular hop. But the funny thing is Darren picked it out because he liked the dill character. Um, so it sort of depends what you like. Um, so during the, the Craft Brewers Conference in Minneapolis, uh, Indie Hops put this in the hands of several breweries around town, and you could go try it at various places. The places I went were all using it in uh, hazy beers, generally like a double IPA, and it is a pretty striking and fruiting and a, a really nice hop. Mm. Mm, that's great. I was hoping with a name like Luminosa, it would glow in the dark, but it doesn't do that, does it? No, no. Generally, if you have three of them, you will glow in the dark. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think I think you answered Stan. Uh, another question I, I wanted to have is, you know, you, Sean, you you work on all these hundreds of of breeds, and you know, the vast majority of them don't go anywhere. Do you ever, you know, go? Okay, well, actually, um, you know, Sabro is super popular right now, so I'm going to go back into my database and see if I have anything else that is uh you know coconut do you ever do you ever back backtrack oh yeah we can do that and some of the more some of the genotypes that i have in the program uh agronomically work very well here in the valley willamette valley but from a sensory standpoint there's just nothing new and unique about it or at least maybe there's something off-putting about it so we'll keep those and use those genotypes as parents in additional crosses but they are, are also there just in case a new market opportunity arises like coconut or something. And then I can go back and look at, at what I might have still lurking about in the program. And then that could be a candidate for a, a new cultivar. Cool, awesome. That's yeah, awesome. in fact, that's yeah. how Cascade made it. Uh, it was just something lurking about in the USDA program and Al Honnell was about to get rid of it. and. Uh, there was a shortage of alpha one year and Coors approached him and asked if he had anything. He says, well, I got this cascade out here. Or at that time, they didn't have a name for it, whatever the designation was. And so they said, all right. And there was, there's a story behind it, but, um, but that's how it got released. It was just something that had been in the program for 20 years. Didn't think it was going to go anywhere. And then there was suddenly there was a market opportunity. And so Al released it as cascade and, here we are all these years later, still about. And I still love that hop. Yeah, I love, right. I love Cascade. 
<laughs> yeah. So that's and that that happens a lot. I think Don is just we we have these genotypes in the program that are pretty good, but there's just something not special about them, and so they don't get released until a later date. Right. Right. So you have so much like back stuff that you can you know. So you almost can tell the future. You can see what's going on and then work from what you have before. And so you're right. you're almost you're ready. Right. So it's not that I can tell the future. It's just yeah. I try to have something on hand that might, you know, address a need that we can release. So that, that's how we do it. We just try to be prepared a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Am, do you have any other questions? Oh, my God. I have so many questions. Okay. We're, we're out of time. We're out of time. I, I want to keep I want to keep nerding out. Uh, yeah. But we can have Stan and Sean on again. That's yeah. Uh, part two. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, but before we go, Stan, Sean, anything you want beer lovers to know about, about new hops? We haven't even talked about lager hops. Oh, and there's a lot going on in those as well. They, the, you know, the thiols are the sexy thing right now and tropical and stuff like that. But when you, you talk about an ongoing future, then, then, uh, there, there are some hops and again, this is another one of Sean's hop, Lorian, that just just got named after last harvest. Is that right? It was released last last harvest. Yeah, last year. Yeah, um, um, a quite nice hop, for instance. So if you, if when you talk about the future of hops, you're really talking about the future of beer. Right. So, um, so so can we push that a little bit more, Stan? Like you're saying, uh, lager hops like what would be fundamentally different about a hop for a lager well you're you're well they work in both and 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 we could go back to yeast and talking about when you even identify uh lager because uh, a lot of brewers are now using uh 3470 which is a lager yeast in their ipas um right. just just because and they're they're fermenting in a warmer temperature so they don't get the ester production uh, which would conflict with with the hop aroma, and it also gives them better uh, shelf stability. So that, that I've kind of wandered off track. But it, in other words, it's, it's, we want to have more variety in just your basic pale lager. It's, Saz is a wonderful hop. Tetnanger is a wonderful hop. But if you're looking for some things different than that, then you'd have something like Lorian um, and, uh, or Contessa from Hopsteiner. And they're just a little bit more American. You know, there's a lot of times a little bit uh, fruitier, not quite as herbal, um, just a slightly different thing. But again, these have to be agronomically uh, sound. Right. right. And so, Sean, with, the, with those, like Lorian, uh, Stan was saying, is one of yours, the parent would be European or one of the parents would be European? Yeah. In the case of Lorian, I did that cross in 2010. And um, that was Sterling is the female parent. And then it's an, an old German or a male from Germ, a German ancestry that has really good agronomic characteristics, but particularly disease resistance here in the Willamette Valley. So that's why I made that particular cross is to get something more on the logger end of the spectrum. And, but as Stan noted, it has a little bit more of an American twist to the, you know, the traditional continental or noble type hop. It's, it's kind of that with an American twist to it. So that's why it's a little bit unique and different that way. Cool. Sound, sounds so, lovely. Yeah, it's, we've had really good feedback from that one. And uh, so it, it's, it's out now. And I think there'll be, I don't know what the acreage is for this particular harvest, but it should be better than last year. And, and Sean's got another cross he made that wasn't named, and I, although I guess Jim hinted it might be. And that one is with the Herzbrucker mother. Yes. Um, and that's just love it. That, that's just, it's beautiful to rub. Um, the, the experimental I had with it apparently had some of a problem. So then they used it in a hazy IPA. So I didn't get a great sense of what it might be like in a lager. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's next year. I'm looking forward to it. Maybe even some cold IPAs, right, Don? You know, yes, we, we, exactly. <laughs> call back uh, to episode one. Sorry, you know. 
if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. I, I have one. I have, yeah. So what you're saying is essentially like, let's say something happens to like Saws hops and Saws is gone. I don't know. I know that that would never happen. You Are you looking to create hops that can kind of mimic or substitute, especially let's say like if something happens in, you know, the Czech Republic or, you know, things could happen, climate change, whatnot, the world is a crazy place. So are we looking to kind of not replace, but I, it's a, yeah. I, I, the, and, and this is the environment Sean was first breeding in. If you looked at what the U S breeding program was doing 40, 50 years ago, that was exactly what they were doing. Just trying to replicate old, old world flavor. So Sterling was that kind of hop, a replacement for sauce that could grow in the Willamette Valley and brewers could use that instead of sauce. Santiam which is a really nice hop, does not store at all. It's just got all kinds of issues, but a beautiful hop. And, th- and it was just replicating those, those aromas and flavor. And, and Cascade was the beginning of change. Hmm. Right. Hmm. So we, uh, yeah, um, I don't necessarily try to replicate uh, what's already out there but we certainly keep our eye on what's coming through the program. And if something would make a nice cascade replacement, but has perhaps a little bit better agronomic characteristics to it, well, then that's certainly something we would keep and, and consider releasing as a replacement if, if needed. But yeah, that's but really hard to do because the, in an aroma hop, as you know, there are hundreds of compounds in there and we don't even have a good feel for which compounds are really important for all the various combinations, let alone the combinations that you get. So it's it's an exceedingly difficult thing to do uh, to try to do a replacement aroma hop. Great, great. Awesome. Well, Stan, Sean, thank you very much. I've learned a lot. Yeah, so have I. This was I was reading about hop reading this morning and I was it's it's a lot of science and I I did not pass science. Um so thank you for coming and explaining what you what you guys do uh, and write about Stan so I can understand it a little better and hopefully our listeners can understand it as well. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you guys for having yep. me on. Yep. Thank you as well. Well, Em, how do you think that went? I think it was awesome. The thing that I think is so fascinating is that we all think of Citra as this like crazy rise to fame. But it really was a slow burn, eight, you know, like 10 years or so, which is, I guess, not a lot. But still, I mean, that's pretty fascinating. Also, it takes 13 years for a hop to go from seedling to name. Right. I mean, that's insane. But I love right. it. <laughs> if you if think back to, uh, so what is 13 years ago, 2009, if, I, if my math is right? Uh, you know, how many breweries did we have uh, in America and, you know, untapped, did it even exist? Like the, the beer world has changed in, in so much time, in, in, in that time. I just find it fascinating that, that uh, these hops that we're just trying now were already in progress. I think that's amazing. It's really cool. It's super cool. I, yeah. I mean, 2009, what was I doing? I was, I was, I was in art school and mm-hmm. I was in Vermont and there was like, not even that many beer breweries in Vermont, you know, and in Connecticut, where I'm from, there was like two breweries and now there's 124. So, I mean, it's insane how things have really taken off and how I think they can tell the future. Yes. Uh, and I think they, they didn't want to admit it, but I mean, they're, no, they're I think they at, can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're looking at climate change and heat tolerance and disease resistance. And, you know, I think they're, I think they're well ahead of the curve. So uh, you heard it here first. John Townsend can, yeah, yeah, he can tell the future. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Uh, Well, uh, please, everybody, uh, if you like the show, subscribe, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. Visit us at allaboutbeer.com and follow us on all the social media platforms at allaboutbeer. And again, uh, please feel free to drop us a couple bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. For the next, yeah, if you have any questions, if you have any questions about hops, if you have any questions for us, feel free to email us, podcast at allaboutbeer.com. Email us about feedback, suggestions. What show do you want to hear? Who do you want us to bring on? Do you want to come on the show? Do you want to advertise with us and give us money? 
uh, we would be open to all those things. So, uh, and actually speaking of advertising, let's have a short word from our sponsor. This show is brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. Athletic Brewing Company's award-winning craft non-alcoholic beers are fit for all times. Downtime, work time, game time, even gym time. Pick a time and grab an athletic because it's about time you could enjoy a great tasting brew anytime you want, even right now. Head to athleticbrewing.com and get some fresh brews delivered. New customers can even get 20% off with code ALLABOUTBEER20 and free shipping on two six packs or more. So if you want to get in touch with me, M. Sauter, I'm at pintsandpanels.com uh, and at Pints and Panels across all social media platforms. And I'm Don Tess. You can reach me at uh, thedawnofbeer.com or across social media channels at the Dawn of Beer. This show is produced by All About Beer. Visit allaboutbeer.com for articles, notes on this show and others, and to connect via the newsletter and social media. Cheers. Cheers.